Good morning and welcome to the first concurrent session of the day, Ensure Integrity in Online Courses. Our presenter today is Dr. Runchalam Chilam Narayanan from the University of North Texas. Dr. Narayanan is an Associate Professor of Analytics in the Department of Information Technology and Decision Sciences at the University of North Texas. He earned a doctorate in Operations Management and Master of Science in Industrial Engineering from Texas A&M University. He also earned a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Mechanical Engineering from the College of Engineering, Gwindi in India. Prior to his appointment at North Texas, he was a, a faculty member in the Industrial Distribution Program in the College of Engineering at Texas A&M University, tenured in 2012, and a faculty member in the Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. If you have any questions for the presenter during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I will hand it over to our presenter. Uh, thank you, Julia. Uh, so I'm probably going to uh, mute my background a little bit because my kid might run in, in between any time. So with that being said, uh, this is me. And uh, thank you, Julia, for the introduction. Um, and I don't claim myself to be an expert in ensuring um, integrity. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, are you all able to see the screen I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, I mean, as usual, the technology thing, Zoom just updated uh, three days ago. And uh, unfortunately, my, my office system is locked from updates until uh, my department of uh, IT group updates it. So right now I'm using a browser-based Zoom. So that's why I'm just not sure whether it's been shared or not. Um, so uh, like Julia said, I've been in uh, academic world for some time now, and I've been teaching uh, online courses for more than 10 years. Um, and definitely the last two years has been challenging because the, the number of students and the online curriculum has increased. And that has also increased our load as a faculty member to make ensure that there is integrity when we are delivering the materials. So I, uh, I would like to share some of the best practices of things that we did and some of the best practices others do. And this is more like an open session. So uh, feel free to write as many questions as you have during Q&A. Uh, we would all like to share and learn from each other. So this is just my view of what is going on and uh, some of the things that I have read about and also I've heard from my colleagues. So let's go ahead and start um, uh, the uh, session. Um, so academic dishonesty. Um, uh, as Julia said, my initial degree in the United States were from Texas A&M, and Texas A&M is known for its honor code, and uh, it's already been ingrained in many of us over here. Uh, but sometimes you may feel let down in, in some cases. You might feel like uh, the academic uh, dishonesty is falling on deaf ears, and that has been some prevalent thought in few folks because it has been so widely prevalent. I like to quote this one interesting thing from an MIT professor. He says, a lot of people cheat a little, and there is also a few people who cheat a lot. Uh, my approach to ensuring integrity is the latter. I want to ensure that the people who cheat a lot don't get away with it. The people who cheat a little bit here and there, uh, we can't control everything. We have to uh, educate them that this is not right, but at the same time, we can't control everything. But if you can make a case out of the two or the five percent of the folks in the class who are egregiously violating the uh, the way the course has been conducted, that's when um, things will change. Um, so research usually suggests that online students are not more likely to cheat than uh, on campus peers. I mean, that's generally the case uh, in the early days before COVID. Uh, um, and the reason why people think that is because before COVID, most of your online courses were technically taught to people who work, who understand the value of money because they are paying out of their pocket or they are getting debt on their name and they want to clear it off. Or people who take online courses are generally older, so they understand the responsibility that they are trying to learn. If they can't, they come and ask you for help. 
Uh, but things have changed drastically after COVID because the population, the demographics have completely changed. We have a lot of younger students who are more technical savvy, who know how to go about things. And so the challenge has tripled, or I would say quadrupled in the last year or so, because the demographic is completely changed. They have more access to tools than what we are used to. When you think of uh, cheating in online courses, um, is it uh, harder because we use these tools? That, that depends on the perception of what type of um, uh, tools that we have. There is quite a bit of tools available now, but how much can you enforce it becomes a challenge. And over the course of the next few minutes, I'll talk about some of the challenges we faced and then what we did and what are things that other folks do um, in, in other uh, universities. So first thing in my current university, after uh, we implemented uh, a lot of online curriculum for the COVID, uh, there was a marked uh, increase in the number of cases that were reported to our uh, academic corner council. About 77% reported, I mean, there was a, a reportedly 77% increase. That doesn't mean 77% of the class is cheating. Don't think like that. This means like, let's say 2% of the students were cheating. Now we have about four or 5% cheating. That's kind of how these numbers work. Um, so, and uh, surprisingly, the number of cases that were reported were higher for the senior students, not for the freshmen and sophomores. Uh, one of the reason is because we probably didn't clamp down initially um, and uh, that's, part and parcel of many of our, our colleagues and partners and what we do. If you don't do it, then towards the end of the college life, they think that it's okay to do that. We are going to graduate what we can get these solutions from somewhere we want, and then let's go ahead and implement it. Um, so that might have happened. And then the other thing is when we went to online, many of our faculty colleagues were not prepared for the online environment. They didn't know what type of assignments to give because when you give an exam in a classroom, um, they are sitting right in front of you. You know what they are doing. But when you go online, uh, they can easily uh, open another browser and type in their questions. And some might say, how about Responders Lockdown Browser? You can have another system, uh, another monitor. A lot of things can. They, there are other things that way that they can cheat themselves. I mean, if you just Google yourself how to cheat Responders Lockdown and Monitor, you will find uh, several ways that people try to show how to do it. And so, so we need to be aware of it and we have to adapt ourselves. I mean, as a, fa as a faculty group, we need to work together, change and figure out what can be done to overcome this. Um, the academic integrity violations, um, uh, first thing to understand is these are not behavior violations. These are academic issue. What we mean by that is, uh, don't think that it's it's uh, the students uh, be uh, don't think of the students like it's their characteristics to in uh, it's in their nature to cheat that's not how we should view it if you view it this as an academic issue and you put this in front of the student and the classroom as an academic issue you'll see a lot more deterrent you're saying that you're you're taking away the credits you're not learning anything and uh, this is cheating and you're cheating your friends and you're bringing down the university name and uh, this is a brand value that we are creating and if you put it in that way you will see a lot more deterrence and you'll also see the other students will come forward and say oh man this person is doing this can you help us out and tell us what we should do the, the more the education from the students the more they report themselves and uh, um, they work together, that's when things can happen. If you go from a top-down approach, it will be very difficult to clamp down on many of these cases. And the other thing you need to understand is whenever you go forward to a student, whenever you find something, be very careful, deal it with a soft hand. The students are usually stressed. And in many cases, whenever, I, at least in my situations, whenever I approach some student regarding some violations, they pretty much accept their fault in four out of five cases. Only in one or two cases, they might say, oh man, I didn't do. In that case, you might just turn it over to the Dean of Students and allow them to handle 
but uh, un- first talk to them before make- taking any actions. You want to understand their side of the story. And in most cases, they would accept their fault and uh, they would change. And you have to give them an opportunity to change. I'm not saying uh, just slap on the wrist, but be firm. Uh, make sure that uh, at least you drop a letter credit, uh, if not an F grade. Uh, that's kind of how uh, I, at least uh, uh, we do it in our area over here. Uh, And the other thing to remember is you have to have a lot of deterrence policies. Do not wait for things to happen and then go about trying to fix it. If you don't have your deterrence policies in place, then you'll have situations like 200 people in an exam cheated. What should we do? Or 500 people in an exam cheated. What should we do? These are things that you can control. How to do that is uh, how you set your question paper, how you... Uh, uh, set up uh, the access to those software and all of that. You need to do beforehand. Don't uh, try all your, uh, uh, have all your checks and balances before you put forward your exam and the assignments online. Uh, Don't wait till the last minute to find out what was the first thing that got, uh, the violation that was committed. One thing I would highly encourage, even though before I go into deep into some of the, the, the techniques is, First thing is don't allow your assignment to be open for a long time, especially uh, quizzes and exams where you want the individual to work on their own. Um, I know some faculty members, oh, this is online course, it's 24-7, let me open up an exam and keep it up for 24 hours. That is a very bad idea. That is a recipe for disaster, according to me. Um, If you allow that to go on for 24 hours, there is a lot of things that the students can do um, even though whatever t- type of technology that you have, there, there could be e- easily a temptation to uh, uh, um, do some unethical things. So try to restrict those time frame. You can always uh, have access to that. Most of the universities, they allow the final exam to be on a particular day of a semester. So during that day, allocate like three or four hours for a two-hour exam and just say, go ahead and take it. In that way, do you control some amount of um, uh, your uh, uh, exam uh, integrity as well as you're giving some flexibility to student rather than 24 hours. There may be situations where one student can come and say, man, I'm working during this hour, but let him or her come to you and then you make that individual exception to that student and say, okay, you can take in the morning, but just don't open it and like an open sesame season and do that. These are some simple things that you can do to control. Um, but overall, uh, let's see what happens over here. Uh, what are some of the violations that we have seen and uh, uh, that are prevalent right now? First thing is other students doing the assignment. This is what I was trying to tell you. If you keep your assignment open for a long time, of like not assignments, like the quizzes and the exams, there is a very good chance that one student can take it for another student or he or she may take it for four or five students. This can happen. And to avoid that, you just reduce the time that the exam is open. So it's only available during a certain time. Some folks try to use tutoring centers, tutoring labs uh, that are there online to do it. Again, the same thing. Uh, try to restrict the time frame and also trace the IP address, block those IP addresses from happening. Uh, we have done that on our cases where we have, uh, 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 if, if the IP address is not known to us, if they don't come through a, a virtual desktop type of a situation, we try to make sure that they have to have prior access before they do the exam. Otherwise, we block them. Um, uh, I have had situations where the assignment was outsourced to a different country. Somebody else in Africa or India or Pakistan actually ended up taking the exam and we caught them and uh, we gave them an F and we asked them to explain themselves. And uh, a couple of them, uh, I have heard that the deans uh, of students also has taken some action against it. So these things can happen and there are ways to control it, like IP tracing and control controlling who have access to these exams. because. If you just allow them to log in using the username and password, that's pretty easy. They can easily give it to someone. Another one is obviously responders monitor. Many of you might be doing it uh, so that you know that the student is logged in during the exam and you know it is him or her taking the exam. So you can keep track and eyeball on what is going on. Uh, And then there is this famous website. Uh, There's one of the websites. There's several of them. Check.com. I hopefully many of you might have heard about check.com. 
Um, this website uh, typically started off as a textbook rental website, but now it tries to sell a lot of solutions to the textbook problem. So if you are in the habit of utilizing only textbook bank questions and textbook uh, problems for all your assignment. I'm not saying you have to come up with a question for your entire coursework, but at least 20 or 25 percent of it should be your own set of questions, which are not from the textbook. Um, and if if you do that, then that's fine, because he if somebody cheats, he or she can't get better than a C grade. But if you you're utilizing everything out of your textbook, then websites like check.com will have the solutions for it. Uh, just to show you a little bit, this is the, the next slide I'm showing you is all from a recent Forbes article, I believe earlier this year in 2021. You can see what check uh, check.com uh, is, is getting in terms of revenue. Since 2019, the revenue has, uh, has almost doubled. Um, they are valued at right now $92 or something per uh, stock price, and it's about valued at $1.2 billion. It has become a mammoth, and a lot of people are utilizing this. Uh, but obviously, they are going to say that they uh, we are not naive to the cheating problem, and they say that they are 100% committed to addressing it. But obviously, it is still not there. When COVID happened, they didn't have the resources. A lot more people were utilizing the website in, in, in a in a manner that was not designed to. And so in mid-January of this year, Chegg introduced something called a Honor Shield. So if you have a set of questions that uh, you're going to post for your assignments, you can post it to Chegg uh, beforehand and you can allow to let Chegg know that these questions and these solutions should not be discussed in the website. They started this program. I have not used it. I don't know how successful it is, but at least they are doing something. I'm not advocating that they're doing it right, but at least they there are some ways if you talk to them and if you find your question paper over there or your solutions over there, you can ask them to remove it because it's your material or it can affect academic integrity. If, uh, there have been some really... Uh, big uh, uh, notable violations using check.com, like a whole entire classroom making mistakes. For example, Texas A&M, uh, just give me one second uh, here. Sorry, can you all hear me? Julia, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry about the, the uh, 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 little hiccup over there. So uh, come, uh, universities like Texas A&M, North Carolina, UCLA, are some of the universities recently reported some very big classroom issues with check.com. About 200 students, 250 students been involved in copying an entire uh, uh, solution from the check because what happened is if you use the entire question paper uh, and you didn't change any of the questions uh, in check.com the set of questions and the multiple choice answers will be there and people were able to answer in like 15 minutes 30 or 40 questions and so it, they were able to answer the question paper more than what it could have taken Time, time taken to read those questions because all they had to do was figure out A, B, C, D, E and just mark those answers there. So such things can happen and it has happened in the last six, eight months and you have to be aware of that. So first thing, do not utilize only textbook based question papers uh, or question bank solution. And that can that is a recipe for another disaster because websites like this uh, have these and you have to customize your uh, approach. Uh, the other one is obviously um, you have uh, things like the group me, the WhatsApp, people utilize that and share solutions. So when you're having, uh, I'm not saying you need to do this for all your assignments. You need to encourage, I mean, college is an environment where we encourage the students to work with each other. So some part of your course should be working with each other. So obviously you should allow these social tools to happen. But when it comes to exams, like two or three exams or your quizzes, you should you should stop them from utilizing the mobile devices. And so you should you, you should have them monitored, like using a uh, responders monitor type of resource, have them to switch off all the cell phones and, um, and uh, encourage that 
to prevent that from happening. So that's the one the way. Um, again and again, I want to stress this is you need to be proactive. You need to prevent it from uh, act, uh, happening before reacting to happening. So you have to have all the tools in place to prevent it from happening. Um, uh, so, so some simple things that many of you I know might be doing is you have multiple versions of the exam. Uh, I am just lucky in a sense, like I generally teach courses that are analytical in nature, so I can change numbers, I can change options. Uh, so I can have one question and create 10 or five different versions by just changing the number. So he or she need to do it on their own to answer it, but that's possible. But sometimes if you're in, um, uh, in a, in a course like an English geography or those type of situations which are um, which where you it's very difficult to create multiple versions that time what I would suggest is uh, use this thumb rule change 20 percent of the questions every semester every year so why I say 20 percent is like I said if somebody cheats I don't want them to get a B or an A grade so by doing 20 percent by changing the 20 percent uh, if he or she just cheats he's uh, they cannot get more than 80 points so um, so you prevent them from getting that that will deter them they, they they'll it will force them to read something uh, so if and also by changing 20 percent of the question every semester within two years you'll have a completely new question paper so that's a thumb rule that i generally encourage my colleagues also to do just don't repeat the question paper don't recycle it um, and uh, and that is that is easily can be utilized Sometimes what some of our department chairs and uh, uh, department colleagues would do is they rotate courses among faculty members. When you rotate co uh, courses among faculty member, uh, what they do is they take the previous colleagues question paper and they themselves will change like 20 or 25 percent of it. That's another way uh, because they may not like the questions or they may want to put some uh, of their ideology in it. And that's another way to keep it fresh and keep the topic uh, refreshing as well as you're preventing these uh, egregious violations from happening. Uh, now I want to do a little bit, uh, even though I'm going to talk a little bit about Hawks Learning because I've been using Hawks Learning for the last two, three years. Um, I've seen some of the features that is very useful. There are other features that other tools can also have. So a couple of examples I'm going to show you are from Hawks Learning. I'm not saying that you need to go and buy Hawks Learning to do it, but you can uh, think about these from, from other uh, learning management LMS standpoints of view. First thing I do is uh, I, I teach one course which involves a lot of statistics. So I use a book called uh, Discovering Business Statistics of Fox Learning. And this is not just for discovering business statistics. Any book that Fox Learning uses, they give you this tool where we they have a place where the students can go and practice and get themselves certified and then they take the quiz. So what I generally look for in the initial stages is, apart from our, how they participate in the online classroom in Canvas, I also look at how they utilize this tool. Um, and um, I, I look at how much time they spend. So here is an example of it. So this is one student who had, a, I give a lot of assignments and you can see he spent a lot of time learning. So some of the exercises are difficult. He spent a lot of time, he practiced and then he went to certification. And sometimes the certifications are pretty simple, it takes a minute and sometimes it takes 30 minutes. So you can see he spent a lot of time. I, I know he or she really worked hard on this. But then here is another classic example. This particular person didn't participate in the canvas. He's never been regular to the class on online meetings or anything. And then um, I know this person is also not good in math because the very first class we had a discussion and, and that person said, oh man, it's very difficult for me. This subject is very difficult for me. And then you look at it, they didn't spend a single minute in learning, single minute in practicing, and they went directly to certification. And some of these certifications are pretty long. So for example, this exercise has 30 questions. There's no way you can do it in three minutes. And some of the questions are pretty simple. I'm not saying each one will take a lot of time. There are subdivisions to it, but three minutes, you need to have a PhD or somebody who's a, who knows the subject, who's been tutoring the subject to take it. Uh, and immediately it flagged up, like she finished the entire course in 88 minutes. Um, so I put up and then, then five minutes, she said, yeah, I, I asked somebody to do my assignments for it. So this is an easier way. Um, and some most of these uh, online management, learning management tools have these time. Um, obviously, you can say, oh, man, tell them uh, somebody can log in and be there. 
yes, I mean, if they are going to think so much and they're going to be logged in and not participate and you have the log dust, yes, they can do some things. But in many cases, you'll see that they'll do stupid things like this, where they will not spend time at all, directly go to the quiz and uh, ask somebody to do it in two, three minutes. And that's a clear violation that you can easily find out that they didn't study the material. I had one such incident this time. What happened was um, there are a lot of tutoring centers around the campuses too. And sometimes these tutoring centers, some of them, they don't know what they're doing. They may give the solution directly to the assignment. So this particular person just went to the tutoring session and 30 minutes later, she, he or she got the answers, went to the computer and started typing in all of it. It, it flagged me and there are like two, three uh, uh, people who went to the same tutoring center, so the same IP address and they all finished the quiz in like three minutes or four minutes. Uh, once, as soon as it flagged, I pulled up and they said, oh, we went to this tutoring center. And uh, I sometimes what I do is I have like a four or five practice questions and I pulled up the practice question and asked them on the spot, can you show me how to solve this? And they were like, oh no, I don't know how to solve this. Uh, uh, the tutor told me how, what answers were there. And I said, that is, that's a clear violation. You should, that is not what the tutoring is supposed to do. Uh, you should be, uh, uh, the tutor should help you understand the subject, not give you the answer. And they understood that they cannot repeat it. And, and the behavior changed and the message went out to the entire campus that this is how we are going to notice. And obviously the tutoring center came back to me and said, oh, we, we want to let you know that we allow the students to take exams over there. Um, but then they had added, uh, add, added this one disclaimer saying that, oh, we don't monitor it. I said, that's exactly what we are doing. We are monitoring it. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't tutor, but make sure that you understand the difference between tutoring and plagiarizing. And, and then afterwards, the tutoring center stopped emailing me. They understood from where I come from. Um, so you, you need to be proactive, like I said. So one thing, this is one instance I, I, I felt uh, Hawks was helpful in helping me. The other one is obviously IP tracing. Um, and I know we are going to do, we are doing online courses and with, especially with COVID and a lot of international students, some of them are stuck outside the country. Um, I encourage you to have at least one or two Zoom sessions or, or uh, WebEx or anything with the students to put a face so they know that the faculty member is seeing them. So that will prevent them uh, from uh, outsourcing to other different countries or utilizing other things. Uh, because what happens is if you don't put a face and you just have a person name at all, uh, I mean, just have only person name in your attendance register, there is very difficult to know where they are and what they do to put a face and if somebody is let's say is is or is he's been traveling or he or she's been traveling and you know that they have been around so the ip addresses go all over the place that can be understandable but if this person lives in texas and has been in texas for a long time he, he works over there but his assignments come from africa asia and europe then you know something is wrong uh, we did one such tracing where we found out that one assignment was done at, uh, let's say, at nine o'clock in the morning in Africa. Uh, in at ten o'clock, uh, the uh, Canvas website was opened in Texas. So these were some clear violations that we looked at. And you might tell me, Chan, this is a lot of work that goes around on it. Uh, and like I said, it's only one or two person. You can easily look at your numbers and uh, the the scores and identify who they are. And after that, you can um, maybe an hour's worth of work every week will help you give you a peace of mind that you're ensuring integrity in the course and the students really, really appreciate it. And the other thing I usually try to do after that is uh, after I find out any of these violations, the very next semester, I put that in the syllabus. Obviously, we can't put the names and such like that, but uh, I put the entire incident and say, this is something that we found out either in my course or in my colleague's course, and then we have clamped down on it. This particular person um, who made this mistake ended up getting an F grade or the dean has uh, uh, sanctioned against this person. Such things like that, letting the students know that we are acting on it will actually deter these things from happening again. So you need to be uh, careful about uh, how you put 
for these things. Another thing you would try to do, uh, what I have found useful in some classes is to have active learning exercises. I know this term is often used in the academic world, but uh, uh, the purpose of using active learning exercises is to allow the students to actually work on it and not just use multiple choice questions and stuff like that. You are there right there in front and you're monitoring how they are doing. It's easier to do in an on-campus situation and an online, it's, it's a little difficult. Um, and the easiest thing that you can do is to allow them to have student projects. Uh, if it's a smaller class, that's possible. But if it's a bigger class, student projects and all of that would take some time. But remember, uh, uh, if, if you really want to clamp down on these academic integrity violations and you want to allow them, students to see how well they perform, sometimes you need to give them some customized assignments um, and figure out a way that uh, um, that reduces your workload on grading. So even I, I gave a project, individual project for about 200 students, but on, on a basis, I probably graded about three minutes per student, not more than that, because the way I structured the project. Again, I was lucky because it's an analytical uh, uh, work, if, but if it is not analytical, if it's like more case-based analysis, it's going to be very difficult. Another thing one of my colleagues did is uh, he made everybody record a video. So he, what he, in, in terms of experiential thing, all his assignments, he said, I don't want your solutions. I want you to record a five minute video explaining how you perform the solution. So at the end of the day, if you have 40 students, all you have to, you get is 40 video files. And when the students know that they have to record, that means they know that they have to do their work because they need to explain. And that's another way to deter. Um, from things from happening. And then what you can do is, it's not necessarily that you need to view all 40 videos. If you have any graduate assistants, you can ask them to view the 40 videos and send the good and the bad ones to you. Or what you can do is you can randomly pick five or 10 of them and see how they did. Um, so that's another way. So in a way is you're putting the student on the spot and asking them to do the individual work and uh, get some credibility from them by seeing it. And another thing, again, I like to stress, start early. Whatever you're planning to do, start early. The very first day when the syllabus is sent out, I send out an ethical statement to them and ask them to sign it and send it back to me. And in that ethical statement, I list what all the previous violations that have happened in this campus and around and what we have done so far. That will deter quickly. So get them to sign a contract, like a syllabus type of a contract before you start the course, uh, because that's the only way that they can understand that you're serious about it. Um, and then um, sometimes these active learning exercises, when, when the students are doing it, let's say they're not able to perform well, but then all the other assignments they're doing extremely well when they are not doing it in person, then you know something is wrong and that way you can also retrace. My very first instances in when I did a course with Hawks Learning, I, I found out was um, I didn't know about all these things in Hawks Learning, but I allowed, the, uh, I had an active learning exercises and that exercise, that, com that student completely blew it. I was like, so what's going on over here? And then I went back to Hawks Learning. He had almost 100% in his, uh, all his work. And after that, I started tracing and I found out that everything was outsourced. And then the, the student agreed that, yeah, he didn't do any of the work and uh, he got caught. So, so sometimes the active learning exercises will also uh, show you some, uh, some people who, try, who violate an other part of the course and, and that can easily be seen in these active exercises. So again, active exercises is obviously have projects and ask them to make some short videos and stuff like that. And these are no longer difficult with all the tools that you have um, and that will help you in clamping down some of these violations. Uh, always be consistent. Again, I've been saying this several times. Be consistent. Be uh, have a high end fist with uh, and um, uh, don't allow anybody to get away with big egregious violations. Okay, um, and uh, always document yourself. And you have to be consistent throughout your department. I mean, you can't be the lone fighting person in your department against these violations. If you are the only one fighting against it, it'll be very very difficult. My department chair has been very supportive and he's been very encouraging to all the faculty members to work as a team. And that's uh, something that has helped us in, in our program. And so you have to be consistent as a department. They should know that this department or this college will not uh, accept these violations. And only by doing that, the population will change. Otherwise, 
if if you do it and the others don't do it and then it, you will get a bad name and then you may end up facing a lot more uh, sanctions from the students rather than the other way around so you have to be careful about that <coughs> so now let's talk about some technologies before i open the floor for questions so what are some technologies obviously the most popular one is responders lockdown um, it's very popular because it is probably integrated in every learning management system. Uh, and even some of the uh, textbooks that have it, have it uh, included in them. And uh, typically they don't charge the students. It is it is uh, built through the college. And so um, they don't see any cost from, from a per <coughs> exam basis. But there are some limitations. First thing is, you um, if you want to monitor them, you want to utilize something called Responders Monitor. And Responders Monitor is you can have something like a camera, like how I have in my room right now. Uh, like I said, um, so if you utilize this uh, camera over here, the camera only faces uh, uh, what a person he or she is doing. So you can only see my room over here. You don't know what is happening behind the screen. So we generally don't have a 360 degree view. So you might you need to be aware of it. They can be having something behind the computer. So so those are things that you should be aware of. Um, and then uh, when you're using responders lockdown, um, the entire browser is locked down. But there are situations where you need to allow them to utilize some tools, some references, some tables. And uh, so for that, what you do is in responders lockdown, there is a way where you can give some exceptions. Um, so when you give exceptions, the browser will allow them to access these websites. So I found out this to be useful for some of my courses where they need ex tables and uh, uh, other information from other websites. But obviously, one of the biggest drawback is, is the calculator option uh, or uh, what we call Excel options. Uh, when it comes to utilizing other software, it's very, very difficult. Uh, they have an Excel. They have a spreadsheet in responders uh, lockdown, but the spreadsheet is very, very simple. It can probably help them with very simple calculations, but if it if you need to use any distribution or any type of advanced formulas, their Excel tool will not be useful. So this is a sample of this web, uh, spreadsheet. Or if you want to utilize any other tools like uh, R or anything like that, it becomes very, very difficult um, to utilize it. So when, it, uh, when you have things like that, uh, you need to be aware that you cannot use responders lockdown when software becomes an issue. So what you can do during those time is um, uh, you have to split the exam. That's what I, we tend to do is we tend to split the exam into two parts where one part, they don't need any other software. So it's completely responders lockdown and monitor. The second part is where they can utilize the software. So in a way you at least control the integrity of a majority of your exam. And also, whenever you give uh, allow the students to take in an open frame uh, where you don't have any monitoring, reduce the time in which they spend. That can also deter them from utilizing other tools outside what you're supposed to do. But there are also other software that I've come across. Um, uh, before that, I'll show you. So people ask me, Responders Monitor. Last time when we did somewhere, people asked me, what does a Responders Monitor do? This is kind of the output of a responders monitor, and it basically highlights some of the videos that have high priority violations. So these things say, oh, these are high priority violations, but you have to be aware of it. These high priority doesn't mean this person, this student actually copied. It means that he or she is moving his head back and forth. You have people who has a problem in taking exam, they are stressed, they'll be moving the head back and forth, and that will violate, the, uh, the, that'll violate the, the frame and that might highlight them. That doesn't mean that they have copied. So be very careful. Just don't click on all these four people who are high violations and just give them a zero and ask them to meet you. That is actually a recipe for disaster because basically you're claiming without evidence that these people copied. You have to go look at the video. Um, I had one uh, instance in in uh, in my colleagues. Uh, I, I wouldn't say the school name. He basically reviewed about 120 students of videos over there, and he found out that uh, there was a big group that collaborated them uh, within themselves and started doing it. And they found out about 20, 25 people who cheated, and um, about five or six of them got debarred. So you can spend the time, but you'll need to spend your time in reviewing those videos. Monitor helps, but what I have found out is sometimes um, we did another thing. So 
uh, like I said, sometimes you need software. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure that they are actually taking the exam. So what I did is I used, uh, uh, I asked them to log into the exam, but if they, since responders monitor and lockdown will prevent them from using anything, I asked them to log in through another software like a Zoom and have the camera facing them and during the exam. So in that way, we knew that they, they know that somebody is monitoring them. And so that deterred many of them from utilizing other tools. So if, if you want the monitoring part of it, but you want them to allow other tools, so you can ask them to uh, log into another device like a phone or a, a mobile device and ask them to do it. Julie, Julie, you have a question or can I continue? I, I apologize for interrupting. We have five minutes left for the Q&A. Um, sure, I it's almost done. This is the last slide. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so coming back to the other tools, and this is my, I, I, I was telling you, this is my last slide because I don't utilize a lot of other tools other than responders lockdown. The other tools uh, that we, uh, that I've heard that people utilize, obviously turn it in that you all know that you can submit the Word document and they can see what has been done. Uh, but there are other monitoring softwares that have become popular. Some of them are 10 years and older, like for example, Web Assessor, Proctor U. They are very old uh, assessment tools, monitoring, remote monitoring tools. They are expensive. They cost about $16 an hour to do it. Some universities, I've heard them use it. For example, Web Assessor started uh, its work in Penn State. Uh, Proctor U is being utilized. I forget the school name. It's one of the Northeast schools over there. But some new ones that have come up in the last few years, uh, last year or so, Examity, Honor Log, all of these are classic examples of uh, uh, where they you outsource the monitoring responsibility to a third party. It's not just to respond as lockdown or monitor. They have their own way of doing it. And uh, they obviously, they are expensive. The, the automated one probably is, I've seen as cheap as $4 an exam. But um, if you want a lot more tools over there, it can go as up as $20. There is one tool I've heard in the last few days is Proctario. What I've heard about this tool is this tool can be used in combination with other software. So, so for situations like where you want them to utilize the advanced Excel and R tools, uh, you may want to consider this. Again, like I said, I have not utilized any of these software right now. Um, I'm still uh, happy with what we can do with responders, lockdown, monitor, Zoom, and active learning exercises. But if you are looking for some tools, you can utilize them. All of these, I'll be providing the slides to Julia. So if uh, you can get access to these links and you can uh, go and look at uh, how these tools are, uh, what the cost of these. Obviously, these are slightly expensive than the others. Uh, with that, I will stop over here and let's answer some questions or discuss. So the first um, question, um, Cheating is wrong, but making honest students work harder in order to prevent others from cheating is also wrong. How do you compensate <laughs> the honest students for the inconvenience of complying with the anti-cheating methods? So you shouldn't give them extra work. Having them to switch on a computer, having them to switch on a monitor, or having them to record a five minute video is not extra work. So uh, that is very important point. You should not ask them to go ahead and do a, a 30 minute or an hour long assignment because you are afraid that the students would cheat. If the assignment is only 15 minutes, figure out a way within that. So, so the one instance where I said my, one of my uh, colleague uses video is in the, the assignment is pretty long, but instead of doing your full assignment and turning in, all he asked them to do is in five minutes, explain what you did. So that's not an extra work over there. So that is very important. You shouldn't give them extra work. Uh, that is not going to help. Good question. Our next, our next question is, uh, what is your opinion on timed exams? Timed exam actually works better. It prevents a lot more uh, um, uh, cheating, in, in my opinion. Because what happens when, when you're timing the exam is uh, you're putting the student in, in, in a in a stressful situation, I mean, I, it's wrong to use the word, but it's exactly like an on-campus thing where you give the question paper in front of them and ask them to take it. They have a restricted amount of time and that prevents them from utilizing other tools. One thing I always say, and that actually gets a lot of chuckles in my classroom is I say, exam is not a place where you invent, discover things. 
it's not a place where you practice. It's a place where you actually need to answer. So if you exams are supposed to be timed. I mean, you're, you, they are not supposed to be like where you give something and ask them to discover that that's a recipe for disaster. So timing, timed exams typically reduce the um, instances of integrity violations. Our next one, can you run the time analytics automatically and flag the suspicious results? It is possible, but obviously anytime you allow the computer to do these AI based stuff, you need to mon you need to also check one more time before you contact the students, especially these tools like these tools over here. All of them have an AI based analytics where they actually analyze the time, they analyze the movements and all of that. But remember, all of this is based on some computer algorithm and you can't go and um, uh, uh, confront a student with that alone. You need to, after, it just flags it. And after that, you need to spend your due diligence in reviewing the case. Um, the next one, can you please explain how to trace IP addresses? Uh, so, so most of these software, these learning management systems record from where the assignments are accessed, it, including Canvas, uh, including um, your uh, uh, Blackboard and all of them, they record the IP addresses like Cox Learning and all of them. They are not readily available to the instructors. What you need to do is you need to contact the your IT group to uh, let them know, give them the name and give them the course number and ask them the time frame that the IP from where they access. They will look at it and get it back to you. It, most of the software don't allow it automatically. Um, even Hawks Learning, I, I've been on back of that thing. Uh, like I've been asking them, man, please let us access the IP address directly. But for uh, they, it's it's for them, it's difficult to allow that to happen. So, but they have been very uh, graceful. Whenever I ask them, like the customer support, within five ten minutes, I get whatever IP address access that I want. So the quick short answer is, it is recorded. It is not readily available to you as an instructor. You need to contact the IT folks to get them. Um, we have time for one last question. Um, I did see a couple of questions come in about the contract example and an example of your ethics statement. Do you have something that you can show them um, really quickly about that? Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. And they also had another question that actually goes with that as well. Um, does your department have a standard statement that students have to sign? Um, so. so, so the short answer is my department has, uh, but obviously uh, in an academic world, you can't enforce every faculty member to do it. So, so we recommend them to utilize something like this. And um, so I'm sharing a, a statement like this. Obviously some initial statement is showing all the standards of UNT and where the policies are and quoting some things. But apart from it, what I do is we make them sign. Apart from it, I give them some examples of what went wrong. So some things I tell them, man, if you remember, if you can Google, I can Google too. So this is something that I tell them. Like if you can Google and find the answer, I can Google and find that answer too. So be very careful when you use it. And so things like that. And then these are some examples. I show them what happened. I don't tell the people. And then I ask them to sign it and send it to me. So they'll have to read it and all the violations, what has happened and what we do, that prevents them from, uh, um, I, I, like I said, it's just an education. You have to educate them that things are wrong. That's the only way to uh, get things done quickly. Um, it looks like we're out of time, but thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Narayan, for giving a wonderful presentation. Um, we did have a couple of Q&A questions that came through that we didn't get a chance to get to, but we will get those answers to you. Um, as for now, we do have a three, quick three question poll that I'm going to share with you all to share your feedback on this presentation. So if you could just take a quick moment to give us your feedback. Additionally, you can look in the chat um, for our concurrent sessions that will begin at 12 p.m. Eastern. You can view the chat for the session meeting room links or access the conference website for a complete list of concurrent sessions and their descriptions. While accessing the conference website, don't forget to swing by the exhibit hall with the Hawks representative one-on-one. -on -one. 
Thank you for joining us. Thank you.